suspect if we start having questions, we'll just overlap with what we're doing. So, uh, Olivier, why don't you come and um, tell us about the French uh, pathways and we see, and then we can compare, contrast, and think about these things together. Thank you, John. Thank you for this uh, invitation to present you the French uh, practices in uh, CLL. Uh, knowing that I hope not to be too redundant uh, with what have been told. Uh, basically, uh, what we do in France is uh, what the German ask us to do on the CLL at least. And uh, um, so I want to go to the next, into the next one. Uh, yeah, here was my, um, my uh, uh, disclosure where on the previous slide and now um, I try to divide uh, uh, six different situations and I will uh, come from the recommendation issued in uh, 2012 at the French Society of Hematology. So the first uh, topic is asymptomatic stage A patient. And so the recommendation was abstention. Why abstention? We, um, in France, a while ago, uh, demonstrated that the addition of chlorambucil um, did not provide any survival advantage in stage A CLL. There was a fair rate of uh, second solid tumor in this uh, uh, treated population, so no advantage. And uh, uh, this has been challenged in the CLL5 um, a CLL7 study, which is a German-French study evaluating the impact of uh, an early treatment by FCR in patients having uh, at least two risk factors. This study showed that in high-risk patients, previous, um, uh, an early treatment will extend the um, time without a next treatment, but there is no impact on survival. So at the moment, the recommendations are the same. Abstention is the gold standard, and I remind that uh, I would remind you that ab abstention is the best chemo-free approach, and that um, treatment uh, should be decided on uh, IWCLL uh, criteria. Now on uh, fit patients, fit patient, it's. FCR whenever the patient is eligible. Why? Because of this, have, and we, on the advantage both on PFS and on survival on FCR showed by the CLL8. We have been impressed by uh, what have been shown and by the fact that uh, in mutated CLL a very long time um, can um, be before relapse. There is a very long time disease control in mutated CLL. On the same way, you can see that patient achieving negative MRD, even as three cycle, can have a very long disease control. So this uh, is important in the future when we'll choose between immunochemotherapy and new agents. You have seen this uh, CLL10 showing with some trouble in the balance between the two arms that in the young patient, PFS is higher with FCR, but with a lower, toxic, uh, lower toxicity. We in France uh, uh, tried to um, compare standard FCR to a dose dense FCR with a preface with high rituximab dose. And we failed to demonstrate any survival, any impact on um, what was our primary endpoint, which was the rate of. CR with negative MRD. So the response is the same in the two arm, maybe a longer, uh, a longer, um, uh, um, sorry about that, a longer uh, follow up will be necessary to see if there is a difference. But a while ago, we had also done this, uh, uh, what I should call dose dense FC. 10 years, with a follow-up of 10 years, as you can see, 50% of the patient with a mutated CLL and 47% with patient with a negative arm MRD are still free of 
progression at 10 years. So at the moment in France, FCR remains the standard, knowing that very long-term control can be expected in mutated CLL and if you obtain negative MRD. BR can be proposed as an alternative if tolerance is a concern, and the type and dose of cytotoxic agent appears to impact the results. Now, what happens with all the patients? All the patients, there is more option, it's more open. So we have this updated result of the CLL11 showing that chlorambucil and, chlorambucil and GA101 is better than chlorambucil in terms of PFS and survival. The same if you compare chlorambucil and rituximab over chlorambucil, but there is no survival advantage of adding GA101 to chlorambucil or rituximab. We in France also uh, worked on an abbreviated treatment with four courses of FCR associated with two extra doses of rituximab in an, an, in a fit old population. Before on the CLL11, it was unfit, people over 65 with a CR, with a CS over six. Here it's a over 65 with a CS below six, but normal clearance. We included 542 patients who have been randomized after this induction of four courses of FCR between rituximab, maintenance, and wait and watch. So the results at the moment are not known. Conversely, we published recently the result of the induction demonstrating that you have 96% overall response rate with up to 20% true CR, but there is 50% neutropenia. But 90% of the population of this population in this interim analysis of 194 patients achieved these four cycles of FCR. So this is feasible in this old population with a CS below six. Again, the CLL10 in the old population can, as you have seen, um, be treated with a BR uh, with uh, some very, very good results. And we found the same uh, kind of uh, results in terms of response on the Babel study comparing in patient ineligible to fludarabine and over 65, they compared uh, chlorambucil and rituximab to bendamustin and rituximab. And here, as you can see, there is 88% overall response rate with 30% CR. So with all these results, our position in France is to say in older and fit patients, you can do with adequate survey an abbreviated course of FCR as has been done in the CLL study. But BR is in this population an alternative. Conversely, in older and unfit patients, there is discussion. We'll, we might shift between uh, from chlorambucil rituximab to chlorambucil GA101, knowing also the result of Peter Hillman with chlorambucil and ofatimumab. BR might be also an alternative in this patient, and chlorambucin alone is considered as a palliative treatment. Now, move, let's move to relapse treatment. For relapse, the choice is based of, on treatment history, biology, and fitness. A while ago, the REACH uh, trial compared FC and FCR in non-heavily pretreated patients. This patient had been pretreated with either chlorambucil or fludarabine. And as you can see, there is with FCR a 30 months, 31 months PFS. Um, the, the end of this uh, trial demonstrated that FCR was a better option than FC in this population with, as you can see, five and seven percent mortality rate. In more heavily pretreatment, Clemens here uh, uh, given these uh, results with an EFS of 15 months in, with BR in previously pretreated treatment. Was import what, what is important to, to um, can I come back? Yeah. Okay. So, 
So here um, you can see that there is, this patient had been more heavily pretreated, but only 10% of the patient had been pretreated with FCR. And the problem today in France and in Europe, I guess, is to treat post FCR relapse. And also, Stephen Stilgenboer uh, gave us this presentation at the ASH in 2010, showing that the patient, there is a, a gap between people, patient relapsing before 24 months or before 24 months or after 24 months. There, so there is a two year cutoff in prognostic in a post FCR relapse. We also did a retrospective analysis in France on 132 patients relapsing post FCR and found a slightly different cutoff of three years. The so same cutoff have been having been uh, also found at the MD Anderson by uh, Constantin Tam. So in this population, now, uh, now however, BR retreatment of, in the world population, retreatment with BR and FCR can provide an 18 months PFS. But anyway, in this population, there is an important cutoff in terms of prognostic between the relapse, any relapse before and after three years. We, uh, based on uh, Clement's data on BR, we built a trial in France uh, with the association of uh, high-dose uh, methylprednisolone. It was also based on the UK data on with Engram, um, one gram per meter square three days, bendamustine and ofatumumab. And uh, we had these results in a population heavily pretreated with 91% FCR, 27% having a 17p deletion and 31% mutation of the TTP, TP53. So 62% of this population belongs to uh, the highest risk patient. And so we had 76% response and 20% CR with some toxicity, of course, not hematological toxicity, which was quite manageable in terms of neutropenia, for example, 30%. But we had one case of uh, progressive uh, leukoencephalitis and one case of uh, EBV-induced uh, lymphoproliferation. But we had, in this population, 18 months PFS, and the median OS is not uh, reached. Five person, five patient could, in this interim analysis on 55 persons, five, per, five patient could proceed to allogeneic transplantation. So now we have in this concert of option uh, the ibrutinib, and as you can see at uh, two years, we had still 70 percent of the population still in remission, but there is no plateau in patients treated as a relapse. So we, come based on this ibrutinib data published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, there were, uh, we had a French uh, named patient program, and within eight months, we included 428 patients with ibrutinib. And uh, then we have, uh, now we have the uh, label used for um, um, ibrutinib in, with the same uh, uh, indication. For idelalizib, we also had a named patient program with idelalizib and rituximab, and within the shorter amount of time, we included 72 patients. And we have, since the same time of October to 2014, the uh, label for um, uh, CLL. But also, as you can see, there is no, uh, of course, it's much better than rituxima, but there is also no plateau in this population. So now, um, here is what is uh, more or less our uh, option in France. If uh, patients are in relapse post FCR over three years, we can retreat with alkylators like uh, bendamustine and rituximab. And um, if there is uh, a relapse, uh, early, an earlier relapse, patient will be treated with BCR inhibitors. 
Now, about uh, this population of patients with uh, 17p deletion and or TP53 mutation. As you can see, there is a strong impact on uh, survival of uh, uh, 17p deletion and also of P53 mutation. Whether or not TP53 mutation alone would be exactly the same than 17p deletion is admitted. It's probably different frontline and on relapse, but anyway, in France, we had the recommendation to look for 17p deletion before any line of treatment, and we'll try as much as possible to also do P53 sequence, nucleotide sequence, to find a mutation. So in this population, or we were used to treat patients with alemtuzumab-based uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, treatment, and we participate in the, on the German CLL 2O trial, and we had these uh, good results in untreated 17p deleted patients, while the, the results in patients in relapse with 17p deletion provide only 10 months uh, PFS. And obviously, the PFS in this population is much better with the ibrutinib. Still, there is no plateau, but the PFS is up to three times more, uh, uh, three times better. And also, with uh, idelalizib, the PFS is better, while lower, with no difference in this uh, uh, trial between patients with and without 17 p deletion. So anyway, with BTK inhibitor, you, we are going from 10 months PFS to at least uh, six, 17 months PFS and maybe 30 months PFS with um, ibrutinib. So um, beyond uh, P53 mutation and 17p deletion, there is other problems. And I think you remember that the ASH meeting, at the ASH meeting, we had a presentation on the impact of complex cytogenetics as being uh, even more potent to predict uh, survival with ibrutinib-based regimens. We uh, put together the results of two UK trial and our BOM trial and found after an NGS, uh, targeted NGS approach that some patients can bear concurrent mutation of TP53, ATM, and SF3B1, and the patient with, with uh, the combination of these mutations have an extremely poor um, prognostic. This will be uh, published uh, hopefully one day, and uh, um, so finally in this population of patients with alteration of uh, P53, uh, we recommend so the assessment before any line and hope to be able to do the screening by molecular biology of TP53 and maybe other mutation. And in case of P53 description, either first line or in relapse, alemtuzumab steroid was the standard, but we moved to BCR inhibitors. I will finish with allogenic transplantation, and in allogenic transplantation, we followed, we followed the EBMT criteria, EBMT criteria based on this uh, data showing that uh, in CLL, uh, long-term disease control, and finally, a cure could be obtained with allogenic transplantation, but with uh, uh, the burden of non-relapse mortality of 15 to 30 percent, and also the burden of chronic GVH disease in up to 50 percent of the population. So, uh, allogeneic transplantation is a uh, cure of the bring the cure of the disease, but with the burden of uh, uh, NRIM and uh, uh, comorbidities, and uh, and, uh, more, and the burden of uh, GVH disease. So. Um, CLL, the, CLL, the CLL3X trial have been demonstrated that uh, you can erase some uh, dismal prognostic factor like uh, 
um, 17p deletion, like uh, SF3B and B1 mutation, etc. So even in poor prognostic uh, CLL, allogenic transplantation can bring a solution. And uh, also, um, CL, um, allogenic transplantation um, has different uh, results based on MRD assessment at uh, one year. Patient with 12 uh, with a persistent MRD at 12 months have a high relapse rate. Based on these uh, results, we um, built a trial uh, where we um, tested the a proactive MRD management based on cyclosporine tapering and DLI infusion in patients with uh, persistent MRD. And here you have two kinds of scenario. There is other kind of scenario, but this is a patient with a positive pre-allogenic transplantation MRD becoming negative upon a preemptive MRD management. And there, this patient will have probably long-term control. Conversely, we have this patient who totally escaped from the allogeneic effect. So uh, how today this uh, study is finished. So we move to the adaptation of the EBMT criteria recently published in blood. And uh, we restrict our indication of allogenic transplantation to the patient with a TP53 TP53 description in relapse. There is some discussion in patients with very early relapse post BR, but at the moment, what is a consensus is to do allogenic transplantation only in this patient. So thank you very much. I'm 